Well, welcome everyone to your Enneagram Coach, the podcast. Guess what? We're on YouTube. So go over there, look at the video, like it, subscribe, and get weekly updates on the episodes. Well, today we are so excited about our special guest today, and I'll tell you about her in a little bit. Um, but we're going to continue the conversation about our new book, More Than Your Number, which is going to be released on September 20th. So go get it. Because um, in it, we describe our new proprietary uh, content on the Enneagram called Enneagram internal profile, and you're going to want to learn how to use this. Makes the Enneagram so much more accessible and easy to use. Okay, so our very special guest today is the best-selling author and my friend, KJ Ramsey, and how the EIP can benefit you as it does for her as a type four. So Jeff, can you like kind of walk us through a little bit about EIP once again, so that those that are new to this, that they can just have a brief overview before we dive right in. You know, I, I will, Beth. And EIP really came out of our own work. Uh, we get trying to understand the various parts of our hearts. Now, many of you hear the language all the time. Part of me wants to do this, part of me wants to do that. Or maybe as a type nine, you resonate with a type two, or you, you, you don't quite understand how this swing stuff works. Or maybe just the descriptions of the Enneagram types themselves just don't capture all of who you are. Mm -hmm. Uh, even being that type. Well, EIP helps us to begin to capture all the various parts of our hearts. It begins with our main type. And so our main type being consisting of two things, our lo beloved and wounded parts. And we're going to get into a description of what that looks like. And then there are four connecting types. That is both wings as well as um, the two paths where the lines on the Enneagram symbol uh, start. Now, one thing that you can do if you're new to EIP, you can go back to episode 112, where you can learn about an overview of each of these concepts. We're going to be walking through them today. Um, and if you're really interested, you can listen to some of the other types as we've been walking through one through nine in not only a description of those types, but also walking through their EIPs. The reason why EIP is so beneficial is it helps us to develop relationships with the various parts of our hearts to bring the truth of the gospel to these parts, to bring healing. And so we, you can imagine what it was like for David to say, like, I have learned to um, bring peace to soothe my soul, or for him to, to say in a searching and humble way, uh, search me and know me, see if there's any unholy way in me. These are ways in which we can join with the Spirit to help shepherd and tend to the various parts of our hearts so that we can live out our sense of calling uh, with courage and with hope, with faith, hope, and love. Yeah. So Beth, why don't you take it from here? Yeah. So uh, the, our special guest we're going to interview is a type four. So I want to just do a quick reminder about type fours, and then we'll introduce her because I really want to get her thoughts on being a type four. So as we know that type fours are so amazing because deep down they have imaginations and feelings and they're so unique and creative but i also want you to realize that deep down they have this hidden idealized self and they really kind of envision this idealized self and passionately desire to be an incredibly creative socially adept and universally desired person and they'll tend to measure themselves against this idealized self and constantly feel that they're coming up short and then feeling that you know this kind of creates this feeling that they're somehow defective and flawed, and they believe that no one is going to truly love them or appreciate them, so they try to strive to become this idealized self, this unique and special person to be loved. Now, for type fours, their focus of attention is to see what is missing, and so they can continue the desire of longing. Now, um, as a type four, they have really experienced a deep-seated reality of beauty, and usually kind of how I describe this is it's almost as if they've been to the Garden of Eden and they literally have seen true beauty and authenticity and depth. And now it's gone and they want to go back to that place. They want to experience what what they already had. And so they long for this and it, they want that deep satisfaction of feeling that again. Now, type fours have so many rich strengths. Um, they experience emotions deeply and passionately. 
They have great intuition and are incredibly creative. And we're not talking about just like painting. A lot of people always go there like, oh, I'm not an artist. I'm like, guys, there's so much more to be creative about. And type fours can really take us to a whole new level of creativity, authenticity, and beauty. They um, also can have very good intuition in what other people are feeling and be able to emotionally support them especially when they're struggling. They are such great um, people that have the capacity to sit in the struggles and the sorrows and the depths of other people. They're not going to be the ones that are going to be like, cheer up, get on with it, let's go. They're the opposite of that. So they are such a good listening ear when you are just in a, in a rough time. Uh, now, their core fear is being inadequate, emotionally cut off, plain, mundane, defective, flawed, and insignificant. But their core desire is to be unique, special, and their most authentic self. But they struggle with the core weakness of envy. And this is where they're feeling tragically flawed and that something is found, something foundational inside them is missing. But others possess these qualities that they lack. Now their core longing is to be to, is to hear you are seen and loved for exactly who you are, special and unique. Well, with that, I want to introduce to you our special guest, and this is KJ Ramsey, and she is a licensed therapist and an incredible author of two books. The first one is This Too Shall Last: Finding Grace When Suffering Lingers which was released in 2020. Now her second book was just released and it's titled The Lord is My Courage, Stepping Through the Shadows of Fear Towards the Voice of Love. Now for me, I devoured this book. I mean, totally devoured it on Audible and reading all of it in between and underlined. Jeff knows I underline like crazy. I mean, I don't I don't think people can quite understand what you mean by you devoured the book. We've been married 26 years. That's true. Um, I'm not sure. I, Aside I, from I, Keller's uh, Shepherd's Look at Psalm 23, I don't know if there's ever been another book that you have devoured. Right. Because you have a, a reading disability. Right. So when you say you devoured it, you mean it. I mean it. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Like a lot of people devour books. I don't. So that says something. So I just want to say, KJ, thank you so much for writing this very timely book. Um, I know I've said to you that um, it really represents a lot of what Jeff and I have gone through in the last um, eight years, just our own journey and our and our own church hurt and wound that we went through. And you just named it. And what I loved about it is the authentic, authenticity and the truthfulness and that you weren't afraid to just go there. Um, and one of the reasons why I wanted to bring you on, one, just because I just am so thankful for this book, but I wanted to bring you on because it means so much to me to have someone to speak the pain and the struggle and the path that one has to go through for healing, just like you did. So I would love to hear, one, a little bit about your book, but also coupled with being a type four. Is that something you can do for us? Absolutely. But first, I have to say just thank you that what you just shared was deeply encouraging to me um, as a writer, as a creative to like be able to write. I tried to write a book that would be digestible. Um, mm. And so that you were able to devour it and you don't devour books often. That's just <laughs> so encouraging to me um, as like yeah, so encouraging, but um, yay. yeah, I, as you mentioned, I'm a type four and I think the one of the good things about being who I am is that I am not afraid of the dark. And so it was a gift and it remains a gift that I get to go to some of the dark places in my own story to invite people into those dark spaces for themselves. Because like, the book goes through um, Psalm 23, phrase by phrase, word by word. In Psalm 23, we see that the way to the water that we most need is through the darkest valley. Yes. And it's a paradox. It's counterintuitive to the narrative that our culture gives us, which is that mm. joy comes through ease. And so I'm grateful that I've been able to articulate 
my own story in a way that I think is welcoming people to walk that path through the dark valley because we desperately need a drink. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah, KJ, it's interesting. Uh, for type fours, there's a stereotype that fours uh, can be maybe be like Eeyore or like they they love to uh, they love sadness. They're, they they love to like bury themselves in sadness. But something that I've come to learn from fours is there's actually a search for beauty. Mm -hmm. And there there's it's not just being comfortable in the dark, but it's actually somehow finding beauty mm -hmm. in the dark. Well, it's like our friend who said it's the sweet set or the sweet melancholy, the sweet melancholy of the soul. That's how mm -hmm. he phrased it. Does that resonate with you? It does. Um, a quote is coming to mind from uh, the therapist and author Francis Weller. And he says something like, if we approach our grief with reverence, something reverent will approach us. Mm. Like mm. there's this interplay relationally of if I approach my sadness with reverence mm -hmm. um, and the darkness with reverence, beauty will approach me. And mm -hmm. I have lived that long enough to trust it to be true. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, and one thing I wanted to bring up for our listeners to understand, like, so when I was reading your book, and I've mentioned this to you in text messages and stuff, but that we're kind of on a very similar path of pain and growth and just the process. So one of the books that you mentioned in um, your book that Jeff just referenced was by W. Philip Keller, which is A Shepherd's Look at Psalms 23. And I just love that book. If you read mm -hmm. my book in the intro, you'll see even a picture that comes from me capturing a moment of my transformation. It's not a picture of me, but it's a picture that transformed my life. And it's just the, um, the transforming work of a sheep in the arms of the shepherd. But what I wanted to say to everyone was, even though you and I have been on similar journeys of learning about God's deep love for us in, in the valleys, in the plateaus, in just all of it, that what you did in your book is very different than if I wrote a book that's similar. And in fact, I would say that probably the book that we wrote this time, even though it's about Enneagram and stuff, is part of the overflow of what I've been learning. And mm -hmm. when you guys read our book versus her book, there's very so different but the reason why i want to capture this is as a nine it would have been too challenging to be able to take people through some of the shadows of life through the dark spots because as a nine i'm more on the optimistic spectrum and i'm like let's see how this all plays out it's all going to be great you know <laughs> and and though that's good there's a place for that what i want people to see is the beauty of what a type four can do is Guys, we do live on this side of heaven, and there are places that have sorrow and pain and struggle, and we don't really want to go there, but there is beauty even there. There's places that we can dig up uh, you know, pieces of treasure along the way. And what I love the most about um, Philip Keller's, no, I wouldn't say the most, but as I'm thinking about this very topic, in his book, um, and I know you'll remember, but he talks about going through the valley and how the shepherd has already gone through the valley. And usually it's these clefts and it's dark mm -hmm. and it's very narrow. And there probably is some water along the way, but he knows which side for the sheeps to be on. He knows exactly what's, and it's very scary, but he's done it before. So if we just focus on him and follow him, he'll get us through that valley into a beautiful, more beautiful place. And so I just want to say thank you for bringing all that God has bestowed in you as you've gone through that valley and you've kind of behind Jesus also shining a light for us to say, Hey, keep following, keep following him. Like there's beauty in that Smith. So anyway, all that to be said, you guys have got to read this book. It's so, <laughs> so helpful. Can't you, that'd be interesting to ask. Uh, so because it was so personal to your story and in light of just the perspective you bring into the world, I mean, in some sense, was writing the book a little bit of a valley for you? Mm, that's a good question. <clears throat> yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, writing my first book was, and that was yeah. in part because I was writing it um, why, while we were in our second experience of a really, no better word for it, toxic church 
mm-hmm. um, working for another toxic church, an anxious in a really anxious system. Um, mm-hmm. And so that was very dark. Uh, Cause first of all, when you write your first book, you like don't know what you're doing. And <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I have a strong five wing and like, not and feeling incompetent is uh-huh. deeply disturbing for me. Um, <clears throat> so it was already going to be a challenge, but it was the more the rupture of trust that we were experiencing a dark valley again. Um, yes. That was very hard for me to walk through with trust, and while at the same time trying to write a book about trusting Jesus in our suffering. So that was my first book. My second. Mm-hmm was actually really liberating to write. It felt so good to tell the truth about what we have lived. And uh, at that point, I write about this a little bit in the book there. I needed to do a little bit of a ritual um, to like release some of the angst. And Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to put this even into the words of like, to, to really remember my belovedness, um, mm-hmm. but release this angst from my first book process and step into, I am beloved and therefore I can trust that God will bring mm-hmm. me through this whole book writing thing and telling my story in a way that is risky. And, um, mm-hmm. and so as I, and partly also my type nine husband uh, was like, okay, look, I love that you wrote a book. I love that they want you to write another book, but I need you to not do it the same way. (laughs) Like you can't essentially in my words, these weren't his words, which he has corrected me on. But like I, he said, I don't, I can't be a receptacle for your angst. Um, And so, yeah. So I had to, really mindfully <laughs> release that just yes, laughing because he's married to a nine he totally gets it oh yes my, like i, just, I wow boo. yes and i was like <laughs> oh i was like okay ryan um yes i am with you i can't i can't do it the same way but then i was left with but how do i do it differently how do i show up and actually like mm-hmm. receive that i'm beloved and i can trust that and so there was just a process of confession and um and making some art that actually hangs over here above my desk and so by the time that I really got into the writing um there was definitely hard stuff about it but the experience was more marked by joy than anything else um I Mm -hmm. loved it I loved I loved the whole process um that's amazing yeah yeah so well, I, I remember the first book. I, I remember reading it, and uh, it came as a recommendation of a friend. And um, so, my my story includes my mom, who my adoptive mom, who carried a lifelong illness. So it, it was like why she couldn't have children in the first place. It's what put her in the hospital year after year, multiple times a year at times. Mm. And it, just the title itself uh, captured something of my childhood experience and what I live with now, that it just lasted. Mm-hmm. And that even even now, parts of my heart still even resistant to think through what I was experiencing as little Jeffrey walking through those things. And so I, I again, just grateful that uh, you leading us down these paths mm-hmm. and that your, your story uh, is particularly helpful uh, for other fellow sufferers. Mm -hmm. But you mentioned something uh, that would be a great transition to talking about the type four and your specific EIP about beloved. So each each main type carries with the the beloved and wounded. The wounded child is the part of us that's the tender parts of our hearts that carry the experience and the stories of living in both a sinful and fallen world. Um, these are the parts that remember the stories. They've seen and interpret the world through the lens of these parts. They're the vulnerable and very tender parts of our hearts. They react from a history of painful experiences and with the desire to find safety, to prime protection from additional harm. So as a child, type fours often uh, have the longing, or they do have the longing of you're, you are seen and loved for exactly who you are, special and unique Longings, feelings, and passions ran deep within them. They used emotions as their primary source to build unique identity. 
They felt often felt disconnected and misunderstood by both of their parents to some degree, which led them to assume that there was something fundamentally missing or tragically flawed within them. And they believed that they needed to be different and unique in order to stand out from, from others so that people might have the reason to love them. And discovering their unique and authentic self became their primary focus. Their wounded child part falsely believes that it's not okay to be functional or too happy, and it longs for others to see their unique abilities and finally feel whole and accepted. Uh, But uh, as an adult, the core longing still remains the same, that you are seen and loved for exactly who you are, special and unique. Um, And so what I'd like to do, KJ, it's interesting the way you put it with your first book, and you're, even your husband experiencing this part of you that felt, like drew him in to need to carry something for you. Mm-hmm. Uh, even you're talking about having a strong five wing, that the part of you that was feeling incompetent. How, can you describe for us what that wounded part of yourself and how it show, how it presents itself? Yeah. Um, I would maybe even put both of the the three wing and the five wing with that, I think there was an interplay there because I have obviously as a four found safety in exceptionalism, like Mm -hmm. being making my way in the world to be exceptional, um, exceptionally good, exceptionally smart or like exceptionally occasionally achieving like, and sorry, my, my dogs are, they're here in my emotions. Um, they're, they're in my dogs. There's a lot of truth in that. It is true. <laughs> right. Yeah. My dogs really are empaths. So everybody, if the people on YouTube can like see that they're, they're like, Ooh, this got intense. We're going to move on. <laughs> um, yeah. It's ridiculous and wonderful. Um, but yeah, I think that the experience of writing the, that first book, it was like you get the initial um, message of exceptionalism that you've longed for. Like get yeah. you get to write a book. And yet then like as a person who finds safety in knowing enough, um, it was like I... I don't know. You've you've got, you guys have read my books. So you've seen like I cite a lot of sources. I I feel like I took on this um, burden to mm. build a strong enough case that I could back up what I was saying um, mm-hmm. by more yeah. than just my experience. And so I felt a deep anxiety that. I wasn't saying enough or including enough mm. or, and then not to say it artfully enough. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I also just, I don't see the world in a very structured way. And uh-huh. so I would just have these marathon um, <laughs> meetings with my husband at our dining room table where I would try to have him help me brainstorm and make order out of the chaos inside of yes. my brain for a new chapter And it was like, I couldn't get him to understand what I was trying to, all the dots I was trying to connect (laughs) at the same time as feeling like, okay, so I don't feel understood. So there's like Mm -hmm. core, core wound, you know? And then um, also I'm like trying to prove too much with the knowledge. And, and then also, you know, you're thinking I have to communicate this in a way that is different. Um, And that achieves success. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So it's kind of everything uh, all at once. That Sure. KJ, do you as a four, do you ever find yourself different enough? Mm. I mean, I think that I you know, I was, we were just with friends um over the weekend on a little vacation and at the end of my friend who we haven't seen in a very long time. Um, it's actually the pastor who married us and his wife, Michelle. Mm. And Michelle said, you know, you're not as weird as you think you are. <laughs> <laughs> was that a helpful thing or a hurtful thing? It was a, hel- I mean, like a, a helpful thing. I think that I, a, maybe a lot of fours take this on. Like you take on this. There are a lot of people that will reflect back to you how strange you are. 
Mm-hmm. And so I'm very comfortable with my strangeness. And I and it's true. Like, I am a strange person. But um, I think that I, it's not... I don't, I, th- I don't think I need at this point in my life to be more strange than I am. Like, I think it, <laughs> it, it is enough. Sure. It's more like about accepting and receiving that I'm, there's more to me than that. And like, yeah. people can accept me sure. there more than I expect them to. Well, what, I mean, one of the things that you just spoke about in regards to the book is you actually created a ritual to help bring out another part of your heart. So, Beth, why don't you talk about the beloved? And Yeah. Yeah. So the beloved child is the part of ourself that really knows who we are and whose we are. It's the aligned part of ourself. And this part is the spirit-led self, and it also knows that Christ is the one who has fully satisfied our core longing. It understands that our relationship with God is all satisfying, joyous, and that then overflows into our lives, especially with our relationships with others. So the beloved child for the type four is is now at a place where they're free of feeling shame, rejection, and thinking that they're defective and flawed. They can now rest um, because they know that the eyes of the one who created them knows them and sees them for exactly who they are, special and unique. And that there's nothing missing inside them. I mean, Christ is the one who designed them exactly the way he wanted it. And that we have, all of us have all of Christ's blessings. So with that, the beloved child of the type four can say things back to itself like, I am not too much or not enough for others. God created me in such a beautiful way that I am a part of a bigger story, a beautiful tapestry that he is weaving together. Because of him, I know and relish in the fact that I belong. So KJ, what is it like when the beloved part of your heart shows up and can nurture and care for the other parts um, from this spirit-led self? Yeah, it is peaceful. It is a sensation of joy. Um, And I I think um, even to carry on the story of like, moving into writing to flesh this out a little bit, moving into writing my second book and like releasing the shame, um, releasing like tending to those wounds in this child self that had to prove her place and Mm -hmm. also be different and all these things. Um, It was like, and this is how I continue to, to write and work when, um, I'll probably get a little, a little like extra therapist right now, <laughs> but that's uh, great. <laughs> Bring it. Okay. Extra so therapist. That's I'm funny. sorry. That's I funny. can't do it. I have, I have to do it, but um, okay. So I love how this is kind of a side note and this is me being all over the place, but this is how I am. So how, what you guys have written and constructed here draws from internal family systems theory. Yes. And yeah. so in this, experience of writing, for example, doing this thing that I love um, has inherent uh, vulnerability to it. And so Mm -hmm. when I find that when, when stress rises, when I feel, when I, when vulnerability is very strong, (laughs) my dog just ran behind me, um, (laughs) that I will experience that wounded, those wounded parts, um, speaking up louder and, yeah. and sometimes trying to call the shots and lead where I yeah. go and what I do and how I do it. But what I experienced in shifting into that second book process and beyond was I could look up to, and this ritual that I did, I made this piece of art and I can look up mm-hmm. when I feel that sensation of stress, when I feel the tightness in my chest mm-hmm. or the pounding in my heart, or um, my face flushes with shame saying something stupid on an interview or whatever, (laughs) Uh, I can look up and remember God brought me through this process before and God will bring me through again. I am not forsaken. I am beloved. I'm seen right here. It's going to be okay. And so this like process of looking up has made it, possible to show up and yes. and live out of this 
place of belovedness rather than mm-hmm. trying to build my own belovedness mm-hmm. out of proving something. Um, right, right. But it's a very well, like we, ongoing process. <laughs> yes. Sure. Oh. No, I mean, you, the use of art like this is is very common because in, in some like it's an experience that engages a part of our heart that maybe we're not attuned to in the moment, mm-hmm. and so it kind of draws us out. Now, Beth, you you have this as well. Mm-hmm. Hey, why don't you share a little bit about the art that you look at? The one that's in the book. <laughs> I I I wasn't thinking that. <laughs> what I don't which. I just no. I, I think that's funny because that's more meaningful to you. It is, but that's the least meaningful piece of art that uh, <laughs> I just love it. So we have elephants in our uh, bedroom yeah. that you look to, and we have another piece of art that has an elephant on it outside. I was not thinking about the lamb picture yeah, at all, all, but it's just so funny. Have... But no, but that lamb is what helps you to get out of your room, yeah. or, or at least it helps to care for it, not to get out of. And that, that's, a, yeah, that's yeah, really yeah. important it's here. Super important. We are not trying to avoid the wounded part of us and sort of spiritually bypass. We're actually hoping to bring care, attunement, attention. Yeah. So, but the lamb does that for you. Oh, that's why it's on my phone. It's on my lock screen. It's been there for like five or no, probably what nine years, I guess. Because I yeah. got I I found it. I mean, our our listeners and watchers are probably like, okay, we're getting in the McCord marriage here. Like, <laughs> what is going on with this? If you want to see this image, you've got to get the book because it's in the introduction. So if you want to see what it looks like, um, but that and the and the elephants capture a lot of you know, my own personal struggles, you know, so I'll, I'll go piggyback on the elephants since you brought that up is, you know, elephants, I feel are very, like, well, and then sleep, sleeping at last, which we interview him, you know, he had the artist paint elephants for nines as well. So I feel like nines really are like elephants because we're very communal. We're very peaceable. We get along. We remember things We're it's just, yeah, it's just a very similar dynamic. Um, at the same time, we're very strong that we don't really believe in our strength until we need to use it. So if there's going to be like, um, you know, a bunch of lions nearby, you better watch out when the elephant gets angry. Like <laughs> the elephant's going to stampede and they definitely get out of the way. But we don't want to have to use that. But one thing that I, I love about, you know, elephants is, is is just this peaceful tenacity, this peaceful strength that they can bring when they're at their healthiest and I really try to remember, so the artwork that you're specifically talking to that um, Adam Breckenridge and his wife Carrie gave to me was um, the matriarch elephant in the front. And you can see behind her the rest of the herd um, at you know all different ages and stages and heights and stuff. And he gave that, and he's on our team, he gave that just as a representation, Beth, that's, this is who you are. This is how we see you. And I know that you don't feel like this most of the time because us nines, we feel like our presence doesn't matter. And who am I? Let me just get in the background. Let me just not say anything. But I have it um, where I work almost all the time like you do, KJ. And I'm constantly looking at it because I'm like. When you look up, that's the first thing you see. Yeah, that's the first Mm -hmm. thing I see. And it's a reminder of don't allow the lies. Don't allow the misaligned wounded child to navigate you in a direction that's not true. It mm-hmm. feels true. It feels a hundred percent true that my pre- my presence mm-hmm. doesn't matter, my voice doesn't matter. But I have to remind myself of what is true, and to keep my eyes fixated really on God and the truth that He brings to me, not my own truth. And that changes the tra- trajectory of all that I do. Would you say the same for you when you? Yeah, yeah, I, I love that. By the way, the image of the um, elephant is so right for my. My type nine husband. Um, yeah, yeah. Right. KJ, is your husband's name Ryan? Is that right? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yep. Okay. Ryan. So you just need to go tell him he's an elephant. <laughs> yeah, he'll appreciate You're it. He'll, he'll beautifully stubborn. The stu- yeah, exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> that is literally what I was about to say. <laughs> Wait, what? Uh, I yes. don't know what you guys are talking about. <laughs> oh, but yes, um, I think I would, I put it um, like, the wounded parts of me are telling 
a truth. They're just not telling the full truth. Right. And because they can't see the full truth. Right. Um, mm-hmm. in, in somatic internal family systems, we talk about being led by our like embodied wise self. Mm-hmm. Um, and that to me is like the self that is hidden with Christ and God that knows its union with Christ. Mm-hmm. And that self, um, she is able with Christ to see the scope of my, my, my whole story, or at least more of the scope of my whole story. Um, I'm not going to have the hubris to say I can see the whole scope, but <laughs> um, I think that the process of looking up is a process of connectedness. And yes. when we're experiencing uh, shame or overwhelm, uh, profound anger, all these things, uh, really that's a expression of stress, mm-hmm. of, of vulnerability. And there's something innately powerful and um, reflective of even our physiology that for both of us to come back home to yes. remembering who we are and whose we are involves this looking up this um, reconnecting to the reality that we are seen and loved by a God who is always with us. Mm -hmm. And physically, that kind of co-regulation makes it possible Mm -hmm. for the body to release her stress and um, rise, rise back into the full truth. Yes. That's so beautiful. Well, let's spend the next few minutes talking about wings. Now, for many people, when they hear about the Enneagram, they end up learning about one or the other wing, and they sometimes it's communicated as a subtype. Well, we'd like for you to think about them a little bit differently, that they're actually just parts of you that can operate both in healthy and unhealthy ways. And we actually access both parts of them. So we're going to talk about type three. And KJ's already even referenced a little bit of this part and how this part shows up in her life. But the type three wing to the type four uh, may focus, maybe a more optimistic, uh, seeking to uh, accomplishment, maybe more adaptable and driven to excel in areas of life. I think uh, the word you're using was exceptional. Mm-hmm. Um, when you're when the wing three part three wing, sorry, I'm getting uh, fumbling over my terms. Uh, it's really when it's trying to protect the wounded child. The, this part of them may actually seek to lo- earn love and admiration by becoming successful and seen as unique individuals. So it's even a particular form of success. They might forego authenticity and shapeshift. Now, that, that totally uh, is confusing to many uh, because they see them this way. So they may choose a particular image to seek praise from others um, or to fulfill something that they feel that they're lacking. They can express too much confidence in how unique they are or perhaps their work or their accomplishments in order to be seen and admired. But this three part of the four's heart, when it trusts the beloved's leadership, actually can show up very healthy. Mm -hmm. And from this place of trust and rest, they may notice that this three part of their heart actually serves their best interests. It, they have a healthy confidence in who God is creating them to be. They no longer strive to earn love and affirmation from others based upon something that they've done, but rather because they've created something meaningful and expresses something of who they really are. They may recover more quickly from emotional setbacks and continue to make substantial progress in personal development. And they may be more optimistic, friendly, upbeat, hardworking, and able to accomplish a great deal. So, KJ, tell us a little bit about how you see this three part show up in your life. Yeah. Oh, goodness. So I think I have a fraught relationship with the three (laughs) part of me. I think Um, I think all fours with a three wing, you know, that that are their three wing is coming alive is a fight, you know, because one is saying one is saying, oh, just shape shift, just just look the part and the four is like no no like we have to be authentic and real here what are you talking about so there's this fight that goes on well i I would say that about my observations with all types in their wings so my training was with allender and he makes much about ambivalence Mm -hmm. and it's it's ambivalence it's competing desires Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. How can I be who people want me to be to feel love and expect, but yet wanting to be unique? Yeah. Um, yeah. And as a six, there's a sense even with like a five wing, um, my, the fiveness wants to isolate, the sixness wants to connect. Yeah. And yeah. I have this kind of hot, cold, <laughs> yes. uh, anxious way of attaching. So tell us about yeah. your hot, cold relationship with <laughs> well, the three. <laughs> yeah, it's, I think... I have spent a lot of my life leaning into my five wing. And so Mm. I'm at this point um, in my life, especially my professional life, where three is showing up more and I Mm. am very uncomfortable with it. (laughs) And I'm like, (laughs) I think there's something I have had some goodness in me around achievement cursed. And I don't Mm. feel naturally that I can trust that when people, when there's accolades for anything that I've achieved, that I'm not about to be deeply wounded. Mm. Um, Mm -hmm. That like this driven part of me, this, um, yeah, the part that can get a lot done uh, mm-hmm. is not going to lead me into <laughs> a, yeah. a place where people end up really hurting me because I most do not want to be, um, I don't want to be loved for what I do. I want to be loved for who I am. And I think mm-hmm. that I feel a tension as an author, particularly to mm-hmm. with that, like, sensing being loved for some things that I am doing. Um, right. And it, it feels it's yeah. So I'm in a, actually a place right now where I'm like, I think that this three little, little, little girl three in me mm-hmm. um, feels a little confused <laughs> about yes. a little, a little confused, a little disoriented. And no, I can see, I can see also though, like, when she does feel adequately seen for like Mm -hmm. her full self, she's able, she is able to be more outgoing than I am naturally as an introvert Mm -hmm. and as a strong Mm -hmm. five wing. Like, yeah, yeah, that I have a little bit more social energy than I Mm -hmm. would typically, or than I have in recent years Um, Mm -hmm. that I am able, I love that recover more quickly from setbacks. Like I'm able to get back to the work. Um, yeah. mm-hmm. and get back to the good. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's been, it's interesting. I'm mm-hmm. in an interesting place with my yes. the, yeah, the and well, part. You, you bring up something really important that I don't know if we've mentioned much on the podcast before, but it's very important to understanding EIP even further. That is other people's relationships to these parts of our heart. Mm-hmm. So you mentioned mm-hmm. about this part of you that's been cursed. Like, not only do we have a relationship and feelings and interpretations of these parts, Mm -hmm. but other people do as well. Mm -hmm. And so uh, even for Beth and I being more entrepreneurial in this season of life, that was not something that was encouraged by either of our parents. Or the groups of, uh, like, the the careers that you were involved in. It wasn't really Mm -hmm. even Mm -hmm. encouraged. So, like, the other people see it. And so, like, this... Part of, maybe there's a part of me that shows up that other people don't like, or let's say a, a, a parent uh, maybe doesn't like that. Maybe they themselves don't have are comfortable with that part of them, and you're showing signs of it. Understand, like sometimes there we live with an interpretation that other people may have, and then to actually attune to that part may become more difficult. Yeah, but yes. you were going to go further. I don't know. It lost well, my, it, I have I have somewhere. a thought. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah the story in mind of a not it's not a like deep childhood moment, but a moment that was pretty seminal in the shaping of how I show up professionally. Uh, so when I was seventeen, I was making my way to go to Covenant College, and I went to this mm-hmm. scholarship weekend where you like. It's basically like a weekend full of auditioning to f- find out like what, how big of a scholarship are you going to get academically? Uh, okay. Yeah. So I go to this thing and I am on and <laughs> I am like working the room and I am making it known like what I want to do as a, I was a community development major and 
I I had a great time and I became very excited about what I the path I was about to be on. Mm-hmm. Went end up going through my whole program, loved it. Um, later, a person who shall remain nameless ended up becoming my <laughs> boss, who was also a professor. And and I find out later in a staff meeting, um, I ended up working for this person in a staff meeting in front of the whole staff that I. This is like one of my first career jobs. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm told, hey, KJ, do you know why you didn't get the full ride scholarship? I say, no, I don't. I got the second, the runner up. Uh, I I find out uh, he says, or this person, he, uh, because you were too ambitious. And I felt that we needed to curb that. Oh. And, And I just like... I sank and it was like, Mm -hmm. wow, I Mm. was, I, a whole like pathway of support that would have gone relationally with that scholarship was barred from me because someone saw me as a young woman as being too ambitious when really like there was a goodness that showed up this innocence. Sure. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think that that's something whether people are have a have a part that's a three or not in them um, for ambition, especially as a woman, mm-hmm. to be cursed like that really messes with yeah. you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, and that gosh, that's such a great story, and just helping people to, to understand like this is a part of your heart, and and this is a part that you've probably pushed aside for quite a long time because of this wounding experience. Had Mm -hmm. it been the opposite, had it been like, I chose you as the number one to get the full ride because you showed ambition, you you knew what you wanted and you were going after it. I bet you would have embraced the three part of your heart at a young age and you would have brought her into the fold of all your parts and let her shine. But because that situation, you're like, oh, no, you can't show up. You yep, know, this was bring... like a decade ago, and it's only now mm-hmm. that I'm like yep. letting her show up a little. Yes, and yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's so important, I think, for people to right. really hear because I think so often, like you would probably say, I'm a four with a strong five wing, which basically alludes I don't really use much of my three. And what we want to say is, it doesn't mean that you're a healthy person if you use them equally you don't Mm -hmm. have to necessarily use them equally we want you to use them both in a beloved format you know we want the beloved child part of your heart to lead the way and no matter how much you use it or not but i do think it's really fun to go hey god gave me both these wings as part of me how can they show up and bless me and so i think that's where you're at right now Mm -hmm. well let's look Mm -hmm. at the type five and i'm sure you're very familiar with this part because the type five is withdrawn. They're wise. They're innovative. They're the observers of the world. They're curious and they crave to learn more, but they fear that they lack inner resources and that too much interaction with others might lead to catastrophic depletion. So they typically withdraw from others and try not to express much of their own needs. Now with uh, this five part of your heart, when it's following the wounded child, it can become fiercely independent building up really strong boundaries to protect themselves from the invasions of maybe other people in their life. And they can feel that uh, their feelings are too much. And so they want to sort out everything just through intellect, which can be kind of tricky for the four because there's so many feelings there. But the five might move in and say, hey, let's bring some intellect into this and figure it out. And they believe um, that their thoughts and emotions are the truth, which can also cause a lot of false reality to be lived out. Um, but when the beloved child part of their heart is in the lead, you might see some of these things where they combined intellectual insights with emotional intuition to produce stunning original works. And generally, that you're going to see that others, um, you know, they have these helpful insights because they have all this information they've gathered over time, and they generously give this to others. And then they connect with others, both from that intellectual and emotional level. So Tell us how you see the five part of your heart show up both in aligned and misaligned ways. Yeah. Um, I started, I've laughed through that whole thing just now because I'm like, <laughs> Oh my gosh. Yes. Um, I started laughing when you talked about the like way that it's almost like, um, I don't know if you, how you put it, but it was 
I have this, I'm constantly monitoring my energy mm-hmm. and I am sort of hoarding it. <laughs> yep. Um, yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so it's this like radar that's extra sensitive and attuned to like how much someone will take from me. And mm-hmm. I'm very selective in like what I will give. So when it's, when I'm more in the wounded self, I'm like gonna, um, I withdraw into especially books um, because mm-hmm. I, I grew up, um, I'm a child, I'm a complex trauma survivor. And so like one of mm-hmm. the main ways I wrote about this a little bit in the book, so it's probably a little familiar to you, but when the way main ways I cared for myself was like retreating into books. And I think I really was <clears throat> associating. Um, I just, I was associating into other stories and to knowledge um, Mm -hmm. to protect myself. And so I still sometimes go there and I, I um, I'm a woman with a disability with multiple chronic illnesses. And so I, for a lot of years in like, I almost um, pendulum swung from living too external to belong to like way internal and mm-hmm. had super fierce boundaries with all the people in my life. And then people, mm-hmm. my friends and husband, but especially my friends, were would feel like jarred by my my aggressive nose. Yeah. <laughs> um yeah. and yeah, I'm I'm finding my way out from that and finding my way into like I guess out of that script of scarcity about my energy. Some of it is true, but not all of it is true. And there's like room to regenerate energy through connection that is I'm still learning how to trust um but I find like the good this beloved child is able to like today and my desk is full of all these like articles so I've got like <laughs> this article about Satan's temptations of Jesus in Dostoevsky and Tolstoy and then like this article about how plants adapt to survive in the desert and I've got like the text of Matthew 4 and I'm bringing it all together um, for a piece I'm writing and it's like that's some of the goodness where it's Mm. like I don't feel any sense of fear that I'm not saying enough or proving enough I'm just delighting in this knowledge Mm. and like getting to share it in a way that will connect to people where they feel disoriented and stuck yeah. in a desert. And, and like, I see it almost like you're painting a picture, but through words. Yes. You're bringing in all the colors, you're mixing them together and you're making it look a very specific way that you want the end reader to experience. Yeah. And using other, amazing. using like knowledge and other sources of people's thoughts um, and work to paint is it's just something that it's part of how God uniquely made my brain um, to like yeah. see the picture and see the colors and where they should go. Um, and so that's, that's a deep joy um, mm-hmm. to be able to communicate things almost like I view myself like a translator, like a mm-hmm. translate different yeah. disciplines to a way that people who don't like to sit around and read articles, <laughs> journal <Yes>. articles, <laughs> um, would can actually digest and like and feel moved by. Yes. Like I'm going to, I read this and I was like shouting like, Oh yes. my gosh, that's so beautiful. That's so good. That's so beautiful. And, <laughs> but like people don't want to go read about the current economic geopolitical situation. And then Jesus's temptations. People don't want to spend their time doing that, <laughs> but I do, you know? Um, Love so that. yeah, I think that she, this beloved, this child who is learning, she, there is enough time and there is enough mm. love. There's enough space to de-stimulate myself. Um, right. She's able to show up with yeah. bringing mm-hmm. together this knowledge and be like, here you go. Yeah. Isn't this yeah. great? <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. All right. Well, let's talk about the Enneagram Pass because those are two remaining parts of your basic EIP. And for you, this is Enneagram Type 2 and Enneagram Type 1. Now, in Enneagram 101, a lot of times people will say, oh, well, when you go to the Type 2, you know, that's when you're under stress. And when you go to Type 1, you're growing, which is true. But 
what we really want people to understand is you use both the healthy and the unhealthy parts of both your Enneagram paths. So for you, you use the healthy and the less healthy paths of two. And so twos are highly relational. They're cheerful. They're talkative. They're engaging. Um, but they can also really struggle from a misaligned place of needing to be needed and trying to make sure that they can um, create dependencies in their relationships that others will feel that inclination to ask for help and attention, uh, to do favors. But they can also, so as a type four, you can also tend to give too much flattery. Um, maybe in groups because you're you're wanting people to secretly kind of say that you belong. So, and uh, well, I guess in other words, that you wouldn't feel rejected. So you might use some flattery to kind of get yourself there. But the beloved part of the type two knows that you are unconditionally loved, that you don't need to help others in order to feel attached and secure, that you belong. Therefore, when your beloved is leading, it leads out of a generous heart with no strings attached to support and encourage others right where they're at. Now, the type one part of your heart, when uh, this is the type of uh, part of your heart where um, it's sensible, it's ethical, it's responsible, it's self-disciplined, it could be very serious. And when it's in the wounded child category, it can be too focused on flaws. It can become judgmental and critical of yourself, others, and the world, and can be very focal about your frustrations and disappointments and can be actually impatient, uh, maybe prickly, and want to have others and yourself fix things right away. Um, but the beloved part of the type one is the part that is emotionally balanced, objective and grounded in your relationships. It can bring about great opportunities because you're stewarding responsibility, discipline and organization while also being very creative at the same time. So I love to hear from you. How has the type two and the type one shown up both in misaligned and aligned ways in your life? Yeah. Oh gosh. Well, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to jump straight to the one, um, sure. because it was so strong. Just the memory came up while you're talking. Um, my mom, when I was little, <clears throat> sometimes would go, you're so critical, critical, critical. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like she would do that motion with her hand for people who aren't watching us. My hand is in a C and it's coming up to my forehead. Um, like I was, I, as a child, very critical of the world around me mm. to the point of like, we would walk around. We, my family loves Disney world mm -hmm. and we would walk around Disney world and I would complain as a small child, uh -huh. how consumeristic it was <laughs> and <Nice>. like <laughs> a waste, a waste of resources. And um, yeah, I, I can see that wounded part now, coming come up in that um the urgency with which i want to fix a problem relationally um mm -hmm. the the part here where you guys talk about being vocal about frustrations i can be very vocal <laughs> with my husband particularly <laughs> about what is wrong what is not ideal in our relationship mm -hmm. um and like i think that moving into receiving my belovedness, I'm able to take a breath and like, let there be a lack of I the ideal in our relationship. I've, I'm looking at, um, I've got this poem a prayer from uh, Teilhard de, de Chardin about like, let at the end where it talks about, it's the poem, um, the prayer, trust in the slow work of God. And the last line is accept the anxiety of feeling yourself in suspense and incomplete. Mm. Um, that like, it's okay for even in my marriage for there to be an incompleteness, a in suspense of like where we are headed mm. Um, mm. in terms of being able to love each other more fully um, the way that I wish we could. Cause I'm, yeah, so attuned to mm -hmm. the the lack wherever it is, just as yes. a four in general. But right, right, and then like, yeah, mundane tasks. I mean, <laughs> <Right>. so hard, <laughs> so necessary. I have yeah. to force myself to. I don't almost ever make to do lists, but like, mm -hmm. I need to. And 
Yeah. yeah I, if you just tap course, into the beloved part of one and three, they will assist you in that category. <laughs> I think so. I think so. <laughs> Sometimes I have to but. even like coach myself, like, like, for instance, if I go up on stage or something and let's say I'm feeling a little nervous or anxious or whatever, I can go, wait a second, I've got the eight right here next to me and I've got the three, like, yes. they're going to help me through like this. That. And yeah, so, I need to think of it like that. Mm-hmm. I've named my three part Charlie. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, sometimes I've been in situations, I went to an entrepreneurial gathering and I wanted to be there, but I was still ambivalent about it. And I said, well, what would Charlie do? Hmm. And it just, it brought up like, okay, it's available to me. I can actually step in. Yep, this. You can. Yep. Yeah. But I, I don't like think that. I'd ever want to ask a part of me to do chores. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want help with that because I no, don't want to do I it. I mean, <laughs> guys, I, for real, um, I prepped for talking to you by looking at this list and I got to the part about embracing mundane tasks as an opportunity to be a good steward. (laughs) And then I made myself call my doctor about needing potentially to get EvuShield as Uh a immunocompromised immunodeficient person because I've been putting it off all day long, even though my husband told me I needed to call my doctor. Yes. So yes, you like, (laughs) Even like, just having like, it on your there, part, like, yes, like your three I part, need this. your three part, and your one part are giving you a high five right now. They're like, yes, yes. I feel it. I was like, hey, <laughs> it's not. It's. I think it's like almost harder to receive the high five from them oh, than sure. the others. You yeah. know? Yeah. Oh, I. Totally like, it's I don't care about that. you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's there's going to be parts of us that we really are resistant to, and I think that yeah. in itself is a curious question to be had and to dive into. You know, there's good reason yeah. for it. Yeah. 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 It, yeah. That's what I'm going to be pondering. Like, yeah. why do I, do I less like being friends with the three and the one part of me? Right. And mm-hmm. there are going to be other type fours that may, it might feel more like the five and the two part for them. Like, yeah. that's why we love the title more than your number. Cause yes. you're more than just one type and it's there. Every type has a different story and a different um, affinity or an annoyance with their parts and it goes hand in hand with her story. So, well, we are just so thankful KJ that you were here today, that you joined us. Like I said, your book has been so meaningful to me and I can't wait to go through it again because Jeff knows that when I devour a book, I devour it several times. (laughs) Like I don't, I can't even tell you how many times I've read, uh, a shepherd looks at Psalms 23. And I'll probably just go read it again. But I mean, I remember. So Beth and I were listening to it. Uh, this is her second round of KJ's. going through it. KJ's book. Yeah, we were on our way to Virginia. I mean, I, I, I don't know how to explain what I was experiencing. I just don't remember significant portions of the highway because I was so reflective on my own story in Jesus. Yeah. So oh like, like Jesus took the wheel. I guess I, I don't know what to say because we were both. I mean, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah. no, that I was a profoundly sorrowful, yeah. healing Well, because we're, we're having to honestly walk through our painful journey again, but with honesty and yet feeling like there's a friend right there with us, yeah. you know, navigating the way. So maybe she was driving. We don't know. Well, and, and KJ, <laughs> a great thing, too, you, you read your book. And so, I mean, it, it is like having... As much as the conversation is warm and sincere here, it just warm and sincere listening to this, uh, it, it is it is yeah. well worth uh, the time to. Uh, and this is not um, a drive through book at Chick Fil A. No, this is a go this, on a drive and really be there. This really is be a present. meaningful occasion. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Well, where can people find you and your work? Yeah. Um, KJRamsey.com has everything, including mm-hmm. links to my books. And I am also on social media at KJ Ramsey Writes, writes as in like writing a book. Uh-huh. Um, and I love Instagram the most. Okay. So, so yeah. people go find her there for sure. Well, thanks everyone for joining us today. And if you know fours, if you have fours in your life that you love, share this episode with them so they can hear what it's like for a type four to experience uh, the Enneagram internal profile for themselves and kind of ponder on, you know, what's that's like for them. And this is really kind of what we do Enneagram coaching. And we have a lot of fabulous certified coaches. If you are interested in finding one, just go to my Enneagram to find one of our great Enneagram coaches, but also pre-order our book more than your number. It releases on September 20th. 
And we just cannot wait for you guys to get your hands on it. It's such a meaningful book. It's been so transformative in our own life for the last couple of years. We can't wait for you guys to get a hold of it and see how the Enneagram can be so much more easily accessible for personal growth. And then make sure that you join us next week where we have the privilege of interviewing Allie Worthington. She's a type seven and an author, speaker, podcaster, and coach who helps women more successfully uh, jump into their careers and businesses, being an entrepreneur and all those great things. She's the founder of the Coach School and the host of the incredible Allie Worthington Show podcast. But as always, remember that the Enneagram reveals your need for Jesus, not your need to work harder. It is the gospel that transforms us.